everyone, how's it going? Team here. And this is part two of building data science with JavaScript. And today I want to talk a bit about microservices, what they are and how exactly we're going to use them within this project. I'm not going to go too in depth, but I am going to add some really good links that will teach you all the nitty and gritty, you know, of the microservices, if you want that kind of stuff. If not, then what I give you here should be sufficient, at least for this course, because um, you're not going to design the architecture yourself, right? So let's start by talking uh, what microservices are. The easiest way to explain that is by comparing them to monolithic solutions. So this is an image from the article by Martin Fowler that the link again is in the description. And here on left, we see the monolithic application that basically puts all the functionality into a single process. So if you watched my building uh, products with JavaScript course, then we did exactly that with the REST interface. The backend had all the functions within one application that we deployed on the servers. And if we would need to scale it, we would just add more servers, right? Not very efficient, but it works to some extent. Uh, adding load balancer in front of that does the job, but this is not resource efficient. So what microservices do is they take those uh, single functions and split them into a separate services that you can scale and distribute by service by replicating those small functions as needed. Basically, you know, if this function has more load, you can spawn more of this and so on and so forth. Um, this allows for some very cool things. So um, let's talk about the benefits of microservices. This is a slide from the Nginx guys. Again, the link to the article that contains it is in the description. So uh, the benefits are as follows. Number one, and this is probably one of the largest ones, is democratization of language and technology choice. So as long as your microservices speak the same uh, language or use the same transport to communicate, be it uh, REST interfaces or uh, message buses or whatever, you can use any programming language. You can have a system that contains microservices that are written in JavaScript, that are written in Python, that are written in Go, and they will work together as one. And this is amazing. Uh, the other thing is that the way you build microservices, uh, you don't use one database for everything. This is like, this is anti-pattern within microservice world, right? Because uh, if everyone writes to the same database, the same thing at the same time, there might be conflicts and this is very hard to uh, reason about. The way it's solved is by giving each microservice, uh, or at least this microservice type, its own database. And the cool thing here is that you can actually mix and match different databases within the same application. So some, uh, some microservices might work with SQL database, while others might work with something like Redis, for example, you know, that has a pops up hub, for example, I don't know. Right, the next uh, cool thing is fast delivery and rolling updates. Um, Microservices rely heavily on being small and fast, right? So uh, compiling them is very easy and deploying them with the rolling updates. If your infrastructure is set up uh, properly with say Docker or Kubernetes or whatever, is not a hard task as well. Although you do need a DevOps specialist that would uh, actually handle all of that, but we'll talk about that in a second. So the next thing is horizontal scale out on demand. So Horizontal scaling, as I already mentioned, uh, with microservices is quite simple. You know, you just spawn more of the microservice that hey, that gets the most load, right? And it's the cool thing about it. All you need to scale is just get more of that. And that is very easy to do, especially with, again, modern technologies like Docker or Kubernetes or whatever the other, like even AWS clouds. Um, the next is obviously modular architecture. So this is, I mean, Again, obvious because you know we have a bunch of microservices that comprise your application. But the also other cool thing is that it's not just the architecture that's modular in this case, but also your uh, team structure, right? You can actually uh, structure teams around those microservices and make a team that works on the microservices that da does data input, team that works on microservices that da does data cleaning, team that works on a microservice that does data processing and so on and so forth, you know? So it's it's a very nice way of uh, structuring the business as well or managing the business. Next thing is easy integration in deployments. Um, I mean, integration is should be if your architecture is designed properly effortless. Deployments, easy, if you're, so this is kind of two-sided thing, you know? If your DevOps and if your CI and CD are set up correctly, then you won't have to do anything to deploy new versions. If they are not set up correctly, and if you don't have a DevOps person, uh, this is this like deployment and integration is literally the hell and you want you will not want to do that. Basically, if you don't have a DevOps person, 
you might want to not use microservices yet. Just get someone who knows their stuff and configure the automatic deployment of all that. The next thing is uh, I would actually put all of that into one point. So service isolation, fail safe recovery and resilience. When you build microservices, you have to account for everything else failing. So when you send off requests to other services, it might never come back or might come back after half an hour. You, you never know, you know, you never know what might break. But you basically have to be resilient and you have to be fail safe and you have to self recover and self heal. If you don't account for that, there might be problems. Um, and that yeah, so the those are the benefits and the downsides that I already mentioned. So there is a lot of complexity with really um, related to the deploying and testing um, integration wise them because testing the service itself is easy It's just like 100 lines or a few hundred lines of code basically. Um, and there's a lot of uh, there might be a lot of issues with designing the original or initial architecture of the product because you might not yet know you know what how it should look how it should interact between each other and so on and so forth so it might be problematic other than that there's not that many drawbacks actually uh, because they are more efficient uh, resource wise it's easier to write them because you can just pick a correct language for them you know use node.js normally for example if you need something highly efficient from CPU standpoint, you can take C, C++, Golang, whatever you imagine, and just build another microservice using that. And, you know, just juggle any languages that you know to fit the scenario that you are actually doing, which is really great. Okay, so uh, now I'm gonna go through the links that I will put in the description just to show you off some of that stuff. So this is the microservices article by Martin Fowler, where I took this image from. It's a great article that describes more in depth what microservices are, uh, what kind of characteristics do they have and what kind of problems and advantages and you know, quite, quite a lot of stuff here. And this is a really great article. So do go through it at least through this one to understand more. There is an Nginx article powering microservices and sockets using Nginx and Kubernetes. It's a bit of advertisement for Nginx obviously because you know they wrote it and they want, to use, they want you to use Nginx as a proxy for microservices. But there are some good stuff here, so do read through it as well. And then I have a bunch of videos here. So um, this is microservices video by Martin Fowler. Um, again, this is more or less the same what says in, uh, what is mentioned in the article, but he just explained it at the conference. So if you are too lazy to read, go watch this one. There is an amazing video from Netflix guys because they are basically masters of uh, microservices. They've been working on them for years and they have open sourced a lot of really cool things. Um, or microservices. Uh, so the video is called Mastering Chaos and Netflix Guide to Microservices. It has some very cool ideas, very cool things that they developed and very cool insights into how microservices work and scale like, you know, Netflix scale. So those guys do a lot of really great stuff. Do watch it, it's very interesting. Uh, and then there's a bunch of videos from Fred George, um, who's a pretty old guy who does a lot of also very cool things. So he does talk about microservices quite a lot. Um, there is three videos from him. One is microservice architecture. Uh, it's not just microservices and challenges in implementing microservices. Um, all of them talk about microservices, both from development and from business perspectives, which is, I think, also very interesting. Uh, so do go and watch them if you're interested. They will give you a lot of very cool things to think about. Now, let us talk about how we're going to apply microservices in our project. So um, thank you, by the way, for recommending Draw.io. I hope my drawings this time <laughs> will be better. Uh, right, so what are we going to do? We're going to have um, an input service, right? So this is going to be... Uh, input service that's going to scrape uh, something. I guess it's going to be something like Metacritic or OpenCritic or whatever we're going to see. And then we're going to use a message bus here for communicating. So we're not going to use uh, REST API. We're going to use message bus uh, because if we pick the correct message bus, we can actually have proper queues and uh, proper, um, I guess I mean queues and then ordering and uh, resilience to microservices, drop offs and stuff like this here without any additional need to, you know, implement redises or anything else like this to store them. So um, the way it will work, the input will send the message to message bus, right? And say, hey, here's a new thing. And then we're going to have a storage service that will um, receive that. 
Okay, how do I I gonna take that? Go here and you go here. So the storage service will get that um input thing and save it to MongoDB or whatever. Oh, some DB, I guess, right? I'm not sure it's gonna be MongoDB yet, but I guess MongoDB would probably work the best in this. Right, so then we save it to this MongoDB, and this is gonna be the only service that writes to this DB actually, right? So uh, then we have a bunch of processing servers um, that are, say, uh, sentiments, right? For example, sentiments, and I guess we can, I guess we can just say processing. But it should be like whatever I talk like processing, uh, what was it like Fox, uh, sentiments analysis, entity extraction, keyword extraction, whatever, right? Then storage basically sends it back to bus and says, uh, hey, you should process this new thing, right? So processing services, get it. Yeah, no. Oh, shit. It's just adding them here, okay. So processing services, no, you're gonna go here. Processing services, get that stuff. And uh, terribly unaligned, okay, whatever. People with OCD, I'm terribly sorry. This is going back. So they process it and send it back to message bus, where in this case, so we're gonna look at this in like timeline, where in this case, uh, they actually, um, it goes all the way back to the storage service, right? So they send it back to message bus, message bus like, okay, hey, I'm gonna send it back and storage picks it up saves the updated data into the database again. And then we're gonna have, I guess, uh, because we had that diagram, if you remember, we had the processing services and then we have enriching services, right? That was linking, for example, the data that we extracted by processing to um, Wikidata or stuff like this basically, right? So, um, getting cluttered very quickly. That is probably a terrible way of displaying it, but um, I don't know it's better right now. So we're gonna roll with it, that a bit. So after the storage saved the stuff from process services, it's gonna send them again back, but this time again, it's gonna send them to, oh, camera, that, no, I cannot do that, why not, whatever. It's gonna send them to enrichment, right? And this time around, uh, we are going to say, okay, enrichment gets the, not what I wanted at all. No. Uh, so they enrich it. They again, send it back to message bus. And after that, they go copy that. They go here. Oh, actually should be the other way around. Okay. Yeah, and sends it back to storage. And that is our pipeline. So the cool thing here is that we're gonna uh, design it in a way that we can have arbitrary processing and arbitrary enriching services that storage doesn't have to know about. So it just says, okay, process. And then the processing services themselves pick up it, then send it back to storage and storage saves it to database. So this is gonna be our pipeline. Again, pluggable enrichable service, pluggable processing service message bus that they communicate through. And then we're gonna have um, REST interface. So there's gonna be REST interface, which will simply actually read from database. So it won't do any writes. It will only run aggregation queries on it. And we're gonna have a UI, which I think guys, you wanted to see, um, what do you call it the Oh, I'm forgetting things, the Vue.js. So I guess we're gonna have a Vue.js UI. Um, this is line, line, how do I make it to side arrow? But whatever, you get it. So basically UI reads from the rest and that's about it, right? So it's uh, pretty straightforward. It might look complicated because I'm terrible at drawing diagrams, <laughs> but actually the main idea is that the inputs save stuff to storage and then storage will basically throw it out and say, hey, process, or if it's already processed and there are enrichment services to say, hey, enrich it, right? And this is what we're gonna do. Um, I think that's about it. So I'm gonna start the next uh, the next 
step or next video, I guess, will be the live stream on Twitch as usual. Probably going to be sometime next week, uh, maybe Wednesday as well, uh, but we're going to see. Right, so do let me know if you have any questions or any suggestions, maybe how to make that architecture better, but this is what I've been using for some time and, you know, for us, it worked out pretty well for data processing. If you have any suggestions, questions, whatever, feel free to ask. Feel free to join the Discord server as usual. I'm always happy to answer your questions there. And I guess I see you next time during the live stream. Bye.